When the phrase Manifest Destiny made its debut in 1845, justifying Americans' land hunger, it captured the nation's mood. The idea first appeared in a Democratic Party newspaper edited by John L. O'Sullivan. He says, the fulfillment of Manifest Destiny means the overspreading of the continent provided by Providence for the development of our yearly multiplying millions. And if you break that statement down, it's fascinating because what he's saying is, first, we're going to get the whole continent. The next thing he says, we're going to do this because Providence is helping us do it, that God is on our side, as some Americans later would like to put it, which is his way of saying what is really driving this is the doubling of the American population every 22 or so years. You've got it all in one sentence. It's a great piece of propaganda. Anyone who opposes it, by definition, then is standing in the way of historical progress and even in, in the way of God's will, because that's how John O'Sullivan, who came up with the term, would have thought of it. There's a lot of divisions that are emerging in the United States in the 1830s and 1840s that Manifest Destiny uh, provides a nice response to or a nice sort of covering over of what's actually happening. First of all, you have increasing class division in the United States. Increasing numbers of very, very poor people are appearing in American cities with the massive immigration from Europe that occurs in the 1840s. Also, you have uh, in the 1820s and into the 1830s the end of slavery in the North. Everybody in New York State who was once a slave has been freed by 1830, and these people are competing with white men for jobs as well. Working men are very interested in Manifest Destiny because they want their own farms. Immigrants see the appeal in gaining new lands as well. So this is an issue which cuts across a lot of divisions in America and makes a lot of sense to politicians. There's one other thing John Ellis Sullivan says at this time, and it's highly racist. It is the assumption that American whites are racially superior and consequently are being guided by providence across the continent. He immediately focuses in on the Mexican population. The Mexican people are like the aboriginal Indians, as he calls them. And you know what we've done to the Indians over the previous century. We can do the same thing to the, to the Mexican people. Mexico had won its independence from Spain in 1821. A sprawling young republic, it stretched from the Yucatan Peninsula to the Oregon Territory, which the United States and Britain both claimed. Amid growing tensions over slavery, James K. Polk, a Democrat and slave owner, won the presidency in 1844 with a razor-thin margin. He refused to let that slow his expansionist agenda. Through negotiations with Britain, he acquired part of the Oregon Territory. But the U.S. had just wrestled a large province called Texas from Mexico. The Mexican government had no interest in losing more land. James K. Polk was a true believer. He really believed in Manifest Destiny. He believed in territorial expansion. He firmly had the democratic ideal that more territory would make the United States a stronger, better nation. And he also recognized that there were a couple of pretty good ports in California that might be useful for some future trade commerce across the Pacific. But however much he could justify an invasion in his own mind, Polk had to persuade the American public to go to war. A lot of New Englanders were opposed to the war from the beginning. They said, this is not God's plan. The United States was a moral nation. She could not go to war against a neighbor. Convinced of his own higher purpose, Polk set out to make Mexico the aggressor. He deliberately stationed troops in a disputed region on the Mexico-Texas border. On April 25, 1846, Mexican troops shot and killed seven U.S. soldiers during a skirmish. Congress quickly gave Polk what he wanted, a declaration of war. ...have at last invaded our territory and shed the blood of our fellow citizens on our own soil. 
You know, we like to think that our president tells us the truth when he talks about something as important as life and death when it has to do with a war. But American presidents haven't always told us the truth. And James K. Polk in 1846 clearly lied when he told the United States that American blood had been shed on American soil. And he did so to start a war that would be popular with the United States, a war for territory, a war for greed, the first war for American empire. He did all that. He had no problem with lying to get us into that war. Abraham Lincoln, who was a first-term congressman from Illinois, opposed Polk and claimed that the war was begun in deceit and proceeded in deception. But a dynamic that would be seen again and again in American foreign policy, particularly in American wars, was if a president can start the war, then Congress finds it almost impossible to stop the war because there very much was this feeling that, okay, we may have differed with the president over the cause of the war, but now our boys are in battle and we have to go to their support. Presidents would recognize, as they could see how it worked for Polk, and they would use it again and again in the 19th and 20th centuries. Americans had no trouble coming up with reasons why invading Mexico was okay. It was justified. It was even a good idea. First of all, Mexicans had proven themselves in the eyes of Americans completely incompetent at governing their own country. Since they first became independent in 1821, there was a series of political coups. So it probably isn't charitable, but a lot of Americans looked at Mexico and they said, you know what, this country is never going to make it. They saw a population which they believed inferior to themselves. They saw beautiful lands which they believed were not being farmed properly, were not being used properly. So Americans looked at that and they said, well, this land would be better utilized according to God's plan in the hands of Anglo-Saxons. And Americans thought, as they always seem to think going into wars, that it would be a short, easy war. Maybe one battle, whoop the Mexicans, uh, Mexico would capitulate, and we would come back home. Everything went according to plan, at first. U.S. troops swept in, occupying key regions and the capital, Mexico City. At this point, Polk is thinking maybe his original plan to just take California and New Mexico isn't enough. Why not take the whole country? But at the same time, you hear a lot of people in the United States say, no, let's end the war now. Mexico was a new kind of war. White Americans had long ignored the inherent tension between expansion and democracy when fighting Indians. Their populations were relatively small. But central Mexico was densely settled, and Mexicans had no interest in becoming U.S. citizens. A lot of soldiers write home and they say, we're not even really sure what the United States is doing in Mexico in the first place. November 26th, 1846, Monterey. Dear Father, there is no fun in cutting throats. I've tried it. If I were to do to the Mexicans as I would have them do to me, I should let them alone. So you have high desertion rates, you have very high casualty rates. In 1848, after two years of war, occupation, and violent resistance, the United States settled for what it initially wanted, California and the Southwest, making it a continental power that stretched from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Mexico lost over a third of its territory. About 13,000 U.S. troops had died, and perhaps twice as many Mexicans. In years to come, Americans would largely forget the U.S.-Mexico War. Mexicans and other Latin Americans would not. In the U.S., 
attention suddenly turned to the new territory of California. Not long after the treaty with Mexico was signed, reports of a certain shiny yellow metal in streams and rivers started an international stampede. So if you lived in New York, first you learned that California had been transferred from Mexico to the United States, and then you learned that gold had been discovered in California, especially if you already, sort of at least, bought into the idea of manifest destiny. You could look and you could say, hmm, that gold has been in California for thousands of years. California was in American possession less than two months before gold was discovered. God clearly intended this as a sign of his blessing upon this American endeavor. By the end of his term in office in 1848, President Polk had almost doubled American territory. He'd promised to be a one-term president, and he was. A grim, hard-working man, Polk died six months after he left the White House probably from exhaustion. The business he left unfinished, whether slavery could be expanded into the new territories he'd won, would tear the country apart little more than a decade later during the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. If manifest destiny is one of the great American themes, then Abraham Lincoln is probably un-American. In 1860-61, Lincoln had to make a historic decision about this expansionism. There was a deal worked out in 1861 called the Crittenden Compromise. There had been deals and compromises about slavery going back to the Constitution when slaves were counted as three-fifths of a person to give slave-owning states more votes in Congress. Senator Crittenden, from the slave state of Kentucky, proposed keeping half of the territory Polk had taken from Mexico open to slavery. Lincoln saw this coming, and he said, what the Crittenden Compromise does is to essentially assure the South that if they expand, as we think they will, we will protect slavery. He said, we're not going to do that. The only manifest destiny, he says, that we should have is the prevention of the expansion of slavery. And so he kills the Crittenden Compromise. Lincoln stood alone and said, I am not going to accept the further expansion of slavery. And when he said that, the Southern representatives and Southerners left Washington. I mean, this was now the Civil War had become inevitable. The way you understand the American Civil War is when you stop American expansionism, you have this explosion, this political explosion, which Lincoln triggered in 1861.